as a Sarah Moore Fitzgerald, um, a prize-winning author and novelist um, uh, that we're very proud of. Also, um, organizational psychology is another little hat you wear in your, in your time. Chair here um, uh, of National Forum for Teaching and Learning. Um, but my favorite um, is Professor at Large, which is the title she gives herself, because she can rove around and do lots of different projects in a very creative way. And it pretty much sums up her attitude to herself, which is quite deprecating and humorous, and also her immense sort of range um, of skills for the different things that she does. So Sarah's going to um, finish up the, 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 the couple of days um, with a, a summarizing of of her thoughts from the professor at large. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a million more. And um, it's just been absolutely fascinating to hear everything that's gone before this moment. Um, I didn't make it to the forum yesterday, but uh, today's discussion has been incredibly illuminating. And it just makes me so proud to be part of a system and of an institution um, and of a set of communities that um, that really are working to become more and more connected through part, the kinds of partnerships that we've seen uh, discussed this morning. Um, what, before I start my short talk on trying to pull together a few other ideas in relate, uh, with a focus on creativity, um, there are two things that Maura has asked me to say. One is don't forget to fill out your evaluation forms um, and leave them where? On the Brilliant. So if you can all do that, I think that will really help in the interests of <coughs> continuous improvement and, on, and, uh, the, and to reflect <coughs> the real um, focus on evaluation, which is one of the principles of UL Engage. And uh, we really are very interested in making sure that you give us feedback, both positive and constructively critical, to make sure that we learn about uh, some of the things that we could think about in the future. I also want to say a very, in case I forget to say this at the end, um, a very thorough and heartfelt thank you to AIEA and to all of the organisers and all the representatives. You've been absolutely fantastic. It's been wonderful uh, to have you um, collaborate with us in this uh, region and um, obviously this whole event wouldn't have happened without your leadership and your participation. So we're really grateful to you and we really appreciate it. <clears throat> Um, I'd like to s pick up on a few things that I heard possibly most recently in the panel discussion because I think they're incredibly powerful. You know, I was asked to talk about the benefits of community-engaged learning. I don't think I need to, to be a champion of that uh, because I think you've demonstrated this and uh, QED is all I can say. Um, it has been demonstrated in, in a range of different important ways and through some very powerful statements that we've just heard. So huge thanks to Kate Morris. We, if we could bottle you and, you know, <laughs> and uh, distribute you more widely, I think that there'd be so many um, issues that we'd be able to tackle together in all sorts of powerful ways. Thank you for participating so enthusiastically and with such great articulacy about um, the purpose and principles of Campus Engage as a, as a concept, but not just as a concept, as, a, as an issue for us to practice in all sorts of ways. Maura, Josephine, Eric, um, Bernie, what can I say? Uh, the kinds of collaborations that we've seen have been demonstrated and explored. Um, and, and I think powerfully, we can see the consistency of the value system that underpins all of this. We don't want communication or community engagement to be exploitative. We don't want it to be patronizing. We want it to be a proper partnership between equal partners where the enthusiasm and energy and know-how of some of an entity like a university can partner with the leadership and the local expertise um, of the communities and that all partners are equal players and that by, by achieving that equality, we can do more together than we ever could apart. I'm really struck by, I think it was Amanda's statement about the boundaries between universities and communities in other parts of the world. We are on a campaign to confront that boundary and to dismantle it and to make those boundaries easier to cross, to understand the differences between the roles and responsibility of different partners, but to work together in a way, in a way that allows those roles and responsibilities to be implemented and delivered in all sorts of exciting ways. So that value system, 
is really important. People think that's all rhetoric. We really need to understand what we're in it for. What is our business here? Why are we doing this? And we need to believe and are, uh, uh, in the, that, that basic value principle and articulate it to more and more people who are getting involved. Because that's the engine that's going to make it work. Any other cynical reason for community partnership will not be sustainable. And, and, we, and so the, the kind of leadership and championing that we've seen both from the communities and from uh, the university really does demonstrate how, how incredibly important that is. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the principle of creativity. We talk an awful lot about it. Um, and I want to talk about it from a number of different perspectives. Um, I have been an educator for a very long time. Um, and one of the things that I say to my students and have always said is, you are going to be more than your day job. Um, and while employability is a very important mandate for universities, um, if we make employability the only holy grail of our function as universities, we are doing ourselves and the communities we serve a massive disservice. And when I say to students, you are more than your day job, I don't say don't worry about employability. Of course we have to worry about it. But I am asking them to think about all the other roles that they're going to play in their lives and all the other challenges that they're going to um, encounter. Um, so, you know, we're in our lives, we're going to be, some of us are going to be parents and some of us are going to be, and we're, most of us are going to be neighbours. Many of us are going to be community activists. I hope we're all going to be voters, helpers, leaders, experts in a whole range of different domains. If we only wear the employability hat as um, educators, then we miss out on this opportunity that's now beginning to be addressed through things like community um, partnership um, in education. And also life is long and life is hard. And when you're a 22-year-old student, you can't predict the kind of joys and sorrows that are going to be part of the fabric of life. It is our duty to educate for life, not just for work. And so my reflections on creativity and education come from the bits of my life that are not just my day job, however important and joyful my day job is. And so I'll tell you a tiny bit more about myself um, yes, I'm a professor at large by day, uh, with a background in pedagogy and psychology. I have been and continue to be chair of the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. I've worked with and talked to Kate and very many other uh, central groups around how we can join forces, how we can pool resources in order to enhance teaching and learning. And um, I admit to you now a little bit more candidly than I used to that I have always had a secret life as a novelist. Um, I came out as a novelist in 2013 with the publication of my first book for young adults um, and since then have made creative writing a very central part of my life. Um, uh, often writing late at night and at weekends but now teaching um, at UL in the creative writing department so it feels like my two worlds are finally, uh, my secret world and my public world are sort of um, coming together in all sorts of uh, interesting ways. So I talk about um, creativity in, um, in three different ways. Um, from my perspective, sorry, yeah, from my perspective as a leader in higher education, from my perspective as a teacher in higher education, and then from my perspective as a writer. Um, and I, I think that reflections from those three different points of view um, give rise to different kinds of insights. So I've thought a lot, and I had a bit of a rant um, earlier on with Kate about this, about how as a leader, um, when I look at all of the developments in higher education over the last 20 years, um, I think we can safely say that there have been, while there have been massive improvements and massive alignment and massive organisation right across the European zone of higher education, and there have also, because of that energy and that focus, been a lot of unintended consequences of this continuous improvement, both at a national and an international level. So here are the things we're thinking about, and here are the things that Kate very articulately presented to us earlier on. 
We need an evidence-based focus. We can't just do anything for the sake of it. We have to gather evidence. We've got to evaluate what we're doing. We've got to make sure that what we're doing makes a difference, that we're not just involved in ritualized activity because it's been done for hundreds of years. Let's justify our existence. That's terribly important. But the focus on an evidence base comes with a bit of a price, I argue. I hazard, and maybe you disagree with me, but I think, uh, and please feel free to, um, but I, I think what's happened with this, um, it, this focus on the importance of an evidence base, which says that we can't really set up for um, creative engagement um, unless we look at the evidence that suggests what's important and what works. There's a lot of paper that ha papers that have been published over the last 20 years saying what works, what makes a difference, how do we add value. And it is a wonderful idea and it's an important idea and it makes sense, but all too often it drives out the moment to moment intuitive switched on practice of the brilliant teacher, of the brilliant activist, of the brilliant engager. Somebody said, I think it was David who said, be yourself. Um, that, the importance of authenticity, of being the person you are, finding out the best version of yourself and being that version um, is terribly, terribly important. And I've seen a lot of discourse around the obsession with an evidence base saying, I wonder can I do this because there's no evidence that this is going to work. And yet there are a lot of really good leadership and a lot of really good teaching and a lot of really good learning comes from listening to your gut, from saying, what do I need to do here at this particular moment in time? What's the right word? What's the right intervention? When do I stop teaching the curriculum and pay attention to something that somebody has said that's not necessarily a learning outcome um, on our module? When, because the brilliant teachers and the brilliant humans in all our context, that's what they do. So I suppose the point is, let's not say we don't need an evidence base, of course we do, but let not the uh, focus on the need for a sound evidence base drown out the intuitive voice of the brilliant human being operating in a very specific context. And I think that's a really important lesson for all of us. And I think if we're going to engage creatively, we've got to make room for that. We've got to listen to the voices of people who may not understand or have in, engaged with all of the theory of educational development that only some people will ever have a chance to be encyclopedic about, let them draw on their own evidence, uh, their own expert base. Um, let's not be so obsessed with evidence that we don't leave room for intuition. And that's not a new age, uh, non-scholarly uh, concept. That's a really important human principle. Another thing that I've seen a lot of, we all have, is this standardization and comparability. Um, Josephine is still here. Josephine works so hard in her role to make sure that we can, and she talked about it this morning, that we can calibrate students, international students' experience um, in a way that can be translated into valuable credits that they can bring back to their home institution. That takes a lot of time. ECTS has been a huge help because it allows us to know that roughly speaking, we're comparing roughly the same amount of hours, the same amount of student effort um, with a, an identifiable uh, transferable credit. The credit system matters. The credit system makes a difference and it's been a huge um, uh, reason for many of the improvements in higher education. Um, but it comes with a but as well. And what happens, I think, or what does happen unintendedly is that it shifts the focus from engagement to compliance. Um, it drives out some of those valuable dynamics that have to do with flexibility, uncertainty, ambiguity, complexity. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but I think that that's an important thing we need to be cautious about because for every large scale improvement, there are prices to pay. And if we know what those prices are, we can reduce um, the expensiveness of those prices. We can be clever about how we respond to that. Um, again, I think it's been absolutely superb to see the focus on professionalization of teaching and learning in higher education. Now there are you know, there are, there's a move to professionalizing people, not just within their own disciplines, but as teachers of their disciplines. And that's great. Um, but too often, 
professionalization has become a tick box exercise, um, basing programs on on uh, principles of learning that are so generic, they don't speak to individuals within their own contexts. So I think we need to be careful about that too. And equally, a, fo a focus on excellence, which of course, nobody can argue with, um, does, I think, occasionally, or more than occasionally, um, come with a different price of this ever increasing list of criteria um, for excellence that becomes mystifying for people within a particular context. So, you know, um, a focus of, on excellence is, is great. We have to be excellent. We have to drive ourselves to be excellent. We are, you know, using taxpayers' money uh, to add value um, to generations of um, students and to involve and, and develop engagement processes. We have a responsibility to be excellent. But let not excellence or the promise of excellence, or the demands for excellence, uh, drive out the need for people to feel safe, to make mistakes, um, to uh, figure out what it is that they're doing, to understand that before you can be excellent, there are all sorts of non-excellent things that you have to do, and things are messy, as uh, Bernie and our panel reminded us, and that sometimes just getting stuck in is enough uh, to help us build towards something that will ultimately be excellent. But if we if we ask people or groups or entities to be excellent without providing the supports and the processes through which they can um, achieve that, then I think we're again doing a disservice. So we just have to be careful. There have been lots of positive changes, but we need to be vigilant. Uh, we need to listen to the voices of people on the ground who really understand how this is going to work and how these processes will come to be. In some ways, um, the discourse about higher education enhancement needs to be simpler. We need to stand back and ask simpler questions and have you know, shorter lists and fewer templates um, because there has been this proliferation of strategic imperative. Every university has to be uh, you know, internationalization, internationalizing, has to be engaging with communities, has to be excellent, has to be uh, focused on research and scholarship has to be able to demonstrate teaching excellence. So this, of course, and all of those things matter, but the proliferation of strategic goals can make things feel a bit too complicated. And you get that fatigue that Marion talked about and that David talked about um, that, that, that can kind of make everything feel almost impossible. So sometimes it's a, it's a matter of simplifying the debate. And one of the ways in which that's been done is through graduate attributes. What do we want to achieve? What kinds of people or learning do we want um, our students to have um, by the time they graduate? That's a really good and powerful question if it's positively and constructively engaged with. And then on the other hand, it also needs to be more complex. Once you have a pull to centralize the debate around any kind of higher education enhancement, there is a risk that you will vanillaize the problem um, and uh, make it so generic that it's almost not relevant to anybody. So if we don't see disciplines as the unit of change, if we don't see people, academics um, and activists who understand particular kinds of contexts and disciplines, then uh, we risk making things over generalized. We, miss, we risk creating templates that are in its effort to be relevant to everybody becomes relevant to nobody. So let's be careful about that too. So in some ways the debate needs to be simpler and in other ways the debate needs to be more complex. And we have to figure out in which context things need to be simplified and in which context things need to be, uh, be become more complex. So that's from the leadership perspective. Let me talk about uh, the teacher perspective. So that's, that's the simple, simple questions. What do I want for my learners? What difference can I make? Really good questions. These are the questions that Bernie starts out with. And these are the kinds of... Uh, questions that we ask at the beginning of a community engaged project. Graduate attributes definitely help. I was involved in the development of the University of Limerick graduate attributes and there were, you know, 1500 attributes when we, we started out, we asked everybody, we got community activists engaged, we got employers engaged, we got students and teachers and scholars and educators from all over the world and our own community to have this conversation. It happened in around 2011 and 12. And um, we started out with a list of 1,500 graduate attributes 
and we whittle them down by lots and lots of conversation, by not having a plan, by listening to everybody, to six key attributes. And I still, it's a bit like the seven doors, I, when I'm asked, him, I, I mean, they should be emblazoned on my heart, but I still forget one of them. I will remember them now um, without having to refer to notes, just to impress you all that I, they still mean something to me. Um, so we said, our, we identified six graduate attributes, and I'll tell you what they are. We want our students to be knowledgeable. We want our students to be articulate. So it's not just that they have a knowledge base, but they, we also want them to be able to articulate that knowledge. And not just articulate it in a particular way, but recognize the different, different kinds of audiences, recognize the kinds of technology now available that we can communicate in a number of different ways through a number of different media. So being articulate um, means being a great communicator, but also recognizing that communication has to change depending on who you're talking to. So we want them to be knowledgeable, we want them to be articulate. We want them to be proactive. We don't want our students to feel um, that they have to wait to be told. We want our students to have agency so they feel they can go into a situation and do something assertive or proactive uh, to make a contribution. We want students to be collaborative, to have an orientation to working with other people. And we want to create experiences that allow them and enable them and make them feel responsible for working with other people and um, so that they've practiced that an awful lot by the time they graduate so that they are natural collaborators almost or that they feel that they're natural collaborators by the time they graduate we want them to be responsible and um, so that's the fifth graduate attribute that i've mentioned Respo so we don't we want them to understand the impact of their actions we want to under them to understand that the choices they make and the decisions they give rise to and the actions they get involved in, small and big, have an impact on the world. And we want them to be able to gauge whether that impact is going to be positive or negative, and if it's the latter, what they need to do in order to change it. So there are the five ones. There are six, but knowledgeable, articulate, proactive, collaborative, responsible. The final, um, and I argue the most important, arguably, um, as long as it's recognized in conjunction with all those other attributes, is we want them to be creative. There's an awful lot of work on creativity in education, an awful lot of critique um, on, uh, on creativity in education, saying that education does not help people to be, become creative. And in many different contexts, I think that's true. Um, but the one place that we see creativity and we see engaged creativity and we see people engaging with new and difficult and added value problems is in the kinds of activities we have seen in the UL practicum. That is where creativity comes alive. That is where the graduate attributes really mean something. And that is where students, as Bernie and the panel have shown us, and can really articulate what it is that they've learned, what kinds of attributes they've developed, and what it means to them. You know, meaningful goals uh, seems to me to be such an important part and of course the research all bears this out, of motivating people. I'm listening to the kinds of rich conversation that we just heard from um, people. I, I, just, I took a few crazy notes here, but it's, you know, Mark holding up human goals that are meaningful. He talked about Bruff, and he talked about the risk that Bruff was losing its soul. And so what Mark was doing as a leader in the community was saving the soul of a town. I can't think of a more meaningful human goal than saving the soul of a town. How evocative is that? That's not rhetoric. That is something that a student in a higher education institution will, will climb a mountain on his or her knees to achieve. It's, it, that is a better learning outcome than a lot of the learning outcomes that I've written over the course of my life. Um, you know, let's have those meaningful learning outcomes. Let's tell the story of our ambitions for ourselves and for each other. Because it's not that we can't do it. It's just that we need to create spaces in which it's possible to have those kinds of conversations. I am so um, proud of the work that my colleagues have done in order to enable that and the community uh, leaders and activists who have been part of that conversation and who have been part of that leadership and of the students who had the courage to step up and to say we're not interested in small scale ambitions around our learning we want to say help to save the soul of a town mm -hmm. 
So yeah, it's important, and the, and the language we use is important as well. Um, so I'd like also then to talk about my life as a writer, because um, while I've been an academic writer all my life, as I said, I've only been a published novelist for a few years, but I have, and now that my worlds have kind of merged, I've done an awful lot of thinking about the kinds of skills that I learnt as a novelist, and that might be different to the skills that I learnt as an academic. Um, and these are some of the things that I um, have reflected on. Um, there comes a stage in the writing of a novel, and it's happened to me four times now because I've written four of them, where my story feels totally chaotic, totally confused, and totally broken, and I haven't got a clue what I'm going to do next. So I often start out with a great idea. I hear somebody telling a joke on a bus, and I think of the story that must be behind that, and I think that could be really interesting. Or I have a memory of something that happened to me as a child, or you know, something triggers the storytelling kind of addict in me. And I say, that could be a really interesting story. And I start with great excitement. And about 10,000 words in, uh, I start to think, this was a terrible idea. <laughs> and it turns, it goes from um, the excitement of a romance to the hard work of a marriage. <laughs> and, um, and it stops being all exciting and flirtatious and oh, fabulous, and this is going to be great. And it suddenly tells me, you are going to have to work really hard at this. And this is not going to be easy. And you have just proved, by acting as if it's easy, you've got to your 10,000 word um, limit, and you've just proved to yourself that uh, you just haven't earned it yet, and you're going to have to work really hard to get out of this mess. And at that point, I haven't got a clue how I'm going to get out of it. I have no idea. And the only way through, and, and, the re and I suppose it's out of pure stubbornness and pig iron, as they say in Limerick, that, um, that I just keep going. And that's the really important lesson. Now that I've written four novels, I get to that point of being stuck. And the only thing that I can uh, draw on is the fact that I've been there before. And I know that if I keep going, I'll probably find my way out of this dark forest. But if it w the first time I did it, which is why I was stuck for many years, I got to my first 10,000 words and I just let myself stay there because I didn't think there was a way out, because I said, oh, yeah, no, I'm not a writer, I'm not a novelist, this is not something I'm entitled to do. Uh, go back to your day job and forget about this dream you have to do something else with another part of your life. Um, but now, because as I say, I'm four novels in, I can say, you've been here before, this is a phenomenon, you are stuck, but if you keep writing, if you keep going, if you keep thinking, you're going to find a way out, and the way out is going to surprise you and dazzle you. And the thing that happens, and anyone who's in the room who's a novelist or who's a creative writer would be able to tell you, extraordinary things happen when you stay with it. And one of the extraordinary things is that your characters do things that you never expected them to do. They become like your own children, you know, they're, you know, who've become teenagers and who have got minds of their own and who no longer do the things that you think they should do. And they surprise you and they annoy you and you beg them sometimes, please don't do that. That's a stupid thing to do, but they will continue to do. And the, excitement of that creative process is something that I can't describe. But any of you, all of you in this room who've done something creative, know your own version of that story. All of you know it. So you can think of, you don't need to think for very long to think, when did I feel completely broken? When did I feel like I hadn't a clue what I was doing? And what happened? Uh, wh what's my story of triumph? And how did I get through that? Are we teaching this enough? You know, are we making things too clear for our students by having an articulated curriculum that tells them exactly how many hours, exactly what topics, exactly what subjects, exactly when they're, doing, they're going to do things by, by extracting every drop of ambiguity out of the curriculum? What are we doing? Are we depriving our students of the opportunity for that wonderful adventure, for that hard fun? And um, that really happens when you roll up your sleeves and you try to discover something new in yourself or something new about your story or something new about your skills. I ask that question critically of myself. I don't think, I think I'm probably more guilty of it than anybody in this room because otherwise you wouldn't be here. But by conforming to a very um, 
articulate curriculum, I think there are other risks. And so we have a theory of writing which says, oh, you prepare, you think about it, you write an outline, you write it, you revise it, you edit it, you proofread, and then you publish it, and that's the way it is. It's never like that. That's the map. But we all know when you have a map, and then when you go to the place that the map is supposed to describe, it's nothing like um, the map tells you. And you say, nobody told me about the big hole here that nobody knew, or nobody told me that it was going to be freezing cold, or nobody told me that I should have brought a few snacks, or, you know, so there's always something that, there's a, you know, what actually happens in the learning environment is so different from what the curriculum describes that we need to give some kind of attention to that. So this is what writing really looks like. I have a thing called draft zero. I don't have time to go into that, but it's very messy. And we can talk about it at coffee if any of you are interested. I have the germ of an idea. I sometimes write fragments of dialogue, plot, structure, voice, character, setting, sound, smells, taste, moment. It, none of it's in the right order. I don't even know what the story is about. I think I might have an idea as to what the two searing moments are. And when I teach students um, who are going to be teachers or lecturers, I say, what are the two most important moments in this lecture? And build a re don't say, how do I start and then how do I get through? Because sometimes you don't get to the important moment then. Decide what the important moments are. They don't, you don't have to give them at the beginning or give them at the end, but know when they're coming and then build all of the um, design of that lesson around those moments. And so I do believe that storytelling and teaching and learning are very deeply and organically connected. And I think I understand that better now because I've spent a little bit more time thinking about how storytelling feeds our lives and our work as educators. So um, then we, so we know what the ser searing moments are. Uh, we build the narrative from within. It's something that a lot of creative writing uh, teachers will tell you. Build the narrative from within. I just think that is such a transferable notion. How do we build the narrative from within? How do we create a group um, of partners and of connectors and of collaborators and communicators? And how do we make the story from inside of that group, not imposed by some expert that thinks they know how this theory is going to work in this practice? How do we build that? That is what the UL practicum is about. That is why this work matters to us, because that's the kind of process that are very intuitively switched on teachers and engagers and educators and community activists and students know about. So again, remember, it's oh, chaos is okay, the point of utter mess. I think uh, Bernie used the, the word mess or messiness at least 10 times today. <laughs> and she's pointing towards something, she's reaching towards something that's so important in higher education, in all education. Um, you know, you can't reach clarity until you've been through the fog. Let's get comfortable with the fog. It doesn't all have to be figured out at the beginning. Our systems, our bureaucracies, our structures would love it to be like that because that allows control and compliance to be ticked off all those important boxes. And yes, okay, I get it. And I've been doing it for 20 years, but there's something more important at the heart of this. There's something more important at the, at the essence, in the essence and soul of education uh, that we all need to pay attention to. I am. Absolutely conscious, I'm preaching to the conversion here, but maybe it's good to hear it nevertheless. Mm -hmm. So, um, how are we for time, Bernie? Oh, I'm just broke. <laughs> <laughs> 25, to just come 25 to open time. Oh, okay. So, all right, so we get. So, um, so, I mean, I, I won't go into too much detail, but what might a new taxonomy of creativity look like? I think it looks like you are to um, so see, these are the kinds of things it takes to be creatively engaged. Being imaginative, new ideas, beyond the obvious, seeing the world in different ways. Being original, newness and significance. Something is new, a new idea, but it's also important and it's meaningful. And it's meaningful to the groups of people that we are and that we're working with. Exploring, experimenting, taking risks, processing, analysing, synthesising. There's a lot of inter this is not just about hearts and minds. There's a lot of intellectual rigour in this, too. Um, communication, transmitting, inspiring, disseminating. All of these activities, I think, can be integrated into a conventional curriculum. But all of them are a natural part of the UL practicum. And that's the difference. It takes work to inject that into a conventional curriculum. But, but the UL practicum is this. 
That's what it's all about, isn't it? Say again? We like to think so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and I see that in all sorts of ways. I won't go through this, I'll let, make those notes available because I know we're stuck for time. But here are the kinds of things I think we should think about when fostering creativity. And I guess my story about writing really reflects that. So I'll just draw your attention to that last statement there. Enhancing exposure to discomfort, to ambiguity, to uncertainty, exploration of divergent perspectives with people who don't share the same worldview as we might, or the same set of experiences, or the same set of assumptions about what life is like, and how easy or difficult certain things are. And so all those are the kinds of things that a really good curriculum in higher education, regardless of the discipline, and will um, foster, and will protect, and will enhance, and will develop. And uh, again, another case for the UL practical and its work. Norman Jackson is a real um, champion and has been for many years of higher education, and you've all probably seen Ken Robinson talk about creativity. So just kind of, again, reflect how important it is. All too often, we squander the opportunity to develop our students' creative talents, preferring compliance and conformity, penalising risk, failure and mistakes, rather than seeing them as important lessons for learning. I can tell you one thing that I know about the UL practicum projects. They were full of mistakes. And people made lots of errors, and people had to go back to the drawing board. But those mistakes were part of the process. And without them, the, uh, it would have been a much more impoverished experience than it was for all of the partners. Again, Ken Robinson says, education kills creativity, doesn't emphasize diversity or individuality. It's not always about awakening the students. It's often about compliance, and has a very linear view of life, which is simply not the case with life at all. And again, if we want to educate, for, if we have a bigger ambition for higher education, we're not just educating for a particular job at a particular time, as I said before, we're educating for life. And so surely we should be designing experiences that reflect what life is like. Messy, chaotic, difficult, full of conflict, full of worry, full of anxiety, full of uncertainty, but full of these magic breakthroughs that happen when we all work together to make something happen. And um, I'm very, critical of something called Bloom's Taxonomy. Anybody know Bloom's Taxonomy? Yeah. Bloom's Taxonomy is the framework on which the entire ECTS credit system was built. Mm -hmm. um, suggesting that you have to be able to remember before you can understand, before you can apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. Bloom, if he was alive, would have said, please don't apply my, uh, this, in, please don't make it have that kind of, um, influential impact because there are so many other things about learning that this does not describe. But it's had these unintended consequences in Europe. And I'll just draw your attention to the blue one, the blue uh, font there. It lowers expectations of learners. It suggests that you have to have done certain things before you can be creative. Um, and if you look at a two-year-old child, uh, they will prove to you that that's not the case just by watching them for five minutes. Um, it continues to encourage a transmissive teaching and learning experience, uh, which again has been critiqued by all sorts of discussion this morning. And it creates a false security blanket for the system. It makes the system very comfortable, but it doesn't necessarily make um, education better. And I think that's, I, I don't want to um, go on about that uh, for too long, but it's an important and interesting thing. I'll just, I will um, perhaps end on the idea that the design features that are more purposefully integrated into our education systems include the kinds of things that we've heard from our panelists today. Uh, Amanda said, look, we didn't really get much time to prepare, we just were thrown in at the deep end. There's nothing wrong with that. Being thrown, the sink or swim concept, as long as there are, you know, lifeguards around <laughs> and that's, you know, that's scaffolded, is a is a, a really good way of learning. So getting thrown at, in at the deep end, not expecting teachers or the academy, for want of a better word, to be the source of all wisdom. Because how could that possibly be the case? You know, we call it, we grandiosely call these institutions universities, as if to say the universe exists within here. Unless we dismantle the walls that surround us, we're never going to really be able to uh, make that claim, and arguably we never have, have been able to make it. And uh, Stephen King has written a book called On Writing, which has become a bit of a Bible over the last few years for me. And he says, you must write the first draft of your novel with the door closed. 
and only if by the time you get to the second draft should you open the door. What, he, what he's really saying is that sometimes you need time on your own to, to, to know what you think, to, know what, you know, to be too connected with all sorts of voices can sometimes feel like the Tower of Babel. So safe sp spaces in which to set out your own story to yourself and then to understand how that has to adapt and be flexible uh, to other, uh, in, in collaboration with other people's stories. That's an important part of designing learning uh, processes that will work for people and not terrify people. And uh, there's a lovely expression in creative writing called show, don't tell. So if you tell people, you know, we spent centuries telling people, look what I'm doing now. This is an ancient uh, didactic form. And there are values in it. And there is value in it because inspiring and passionate uh, declarers telling people things it has always been interesting, only as long as it sparks and engages with what's going on inside the tell these heads. And otherwise it just becomes a boring kind of uh, monologue that nobody listens to. So, but showing is so much more important. So when you start telling in a in a, when you're telling a story, when you're writing novels, one of the first things I learned to improve my writing was, you know, don't tell me a character was frightened. Show the bead of sweat that slowly slides down the side of his face. Once you describe that, the readers will fill in the gap. They'll know that he's frightened, or they'll imagine, or they'll guess that he's frightened. It was Chekhov who said, don't tell me the moon is shining, show me the glint of light on broken glass. And what he was trying, what he was reaching for was, you know, our expertise only matters if we have the imagination to make it evocative uh, for the people that we're trying to communicate with. And also, um, to make it truer, because the moon is shining, is such a cliche thing to say, but the glint of light on broken glass helps people to pay attention to something that's grittier, to something that's more difficult, to something that's more complicated, to something that perhaps uh, requires our engagement, makes us work a little bit harder. So um, showing makes us all work harder rather than telling, which is a comfortable place to be. The value of iteration, of you know, recognizing that the journey is long, that there are no shortcuts, and that sometimes you have to go back to the beginning. But in every revisiting to the beginning, you are enriched in some way. There's an old saying, you can never go home. Because when you go home, you've learned so much because you had to come somewhere, from you've been somewhere else, that your, your home looks different and that all of the lessons that you've learned um, are, allow you to see your home anew. And, all, and that matters too. The value of reflection is the same. Widespread supports, not just a single sage on the stage, as they say, but lots and lots of people working together, creating different kinds of support, broadening the base of support to allow this magic thing to happen. And psychological safety, you know, throwing people in at the deep end, but also having enough scaffolding to make sure people don't feel abandoned or that they can't reach out, that they can't go somewhere to look for help. The recognition of the value of intrinsic motivation. I talked about that earlier, the idea that, you know, um, once students and collaborators and partners are motivated uh, by meaningful goals, a lot of the job of the teacher is just to stand out of everybody's way and let the work happen. Um, and there is, as one of the, I think it was Catherine, who said, you know, sometimes enthusiasm is enough. Official circles, it's kind of a joke in a lot of political circles that, that enthusiasm is an insult. You know, when you describe somebody as enthusiastic, it, it, there's a rather cynical notion that that's actually saying something not very nice about somebody. And um, enthusiasm is the key to so much of human endeavor. It opens the door to so many other possibilities. If we start with the creative notion, and all that other stuff like mem remembering and applying <coughs> and theorizing will kind of look after itself. Or if it doesn't, at least it, it becomes more possible uh, once we have somebody's attention, once people are prepared to focus. Um, and so, uh, to finish, um, I mean, that, yeah, again, that's the community, community engaged learning, I think, really does reflect all of those principles. Um, but, you know, some of the things that I've learned um, as a writer are remind, remind me of some of the things that you've all been telling us today. And um, it's okay not to have a clue what you're doing sometimes. Um, sometimes keeping on going and staying with it uh, helps you not just to get through, but it, it helps you to become more persistent. There are no shortcuts. 
Um, and theory sometimes only really helps once you've engaged in practice. That was Amanda's point, I think. And um, that often the action itself is a generative process and that you don't know what your story is about until you've actually told the story. And there is only so much planning that you can do. Um, and arguably too much planning can paralyze you and can make you feel the things that are actually possible are impossible. And surely that's the opposite of what higher education should be doing. It should be looking at what everyone says is impossible and saying, this is possible, and let's design, and let's collaborate, and let's communicate and connect in a way that proves that to be the case. Thank you very much. <laughs>
the books were supposed to come from the UK, a consignment were ordered and dispatched in the UK only yesterday. It hadn't arrived in time for the kids. She was jinxed it every day. But you know, we had to get to it. We said, no, okay, don't worry about that. Don't worry, you know, you will, you'll be able to um, bring the books to our next year. So most of us will want to buy them. But I just thought I'd tell you that. Does it have to do it? Mary, thank you for that. That was uh, the, a nice way to finish the conference and also talking about perseverance, um, enthusiasm and human spirit. Um, so I think a lot of what we've been talking about the last couple of days. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.